Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Scotland podcast, episode 22, Malcolm and William Rufus. Last week I mentioned, and something I'll keep bringing up and plugging, is that we post updates for the podcast on Twitter. Please follow the History of SC1, or the History of Scotland, on Twitter, or head to our Facebook group called The History of Scotland. There you can discuss the episodes with myself, give me any feedbacks, and leave any comments you wish there as well. So, time we went over another giant influence in our new king's life. Someone who through her own experience, bloodshed, loss, had helped guide Scotland with Malcolm into something great and potentially helped him save a lot of face after the whole Macbeth killing. This was of course Margaret of Wessex, or otherwise known as Saint Margaret of Scotland. It was a rather great episode to record, and I feel like I personally enjoyed learning about the history of Margaret, learning from a historical standpoint, but also how much of an impact she has in the modern day in terms of religious worship. Anyhow, let's move into today's episode and back into the perspective of Malcolm III, our gracious King of Scotland, newly renamed from Alba in our narrative. He will start to make changes within the Scottish court, how it runs and performs, as well as the new administrative reforms throughout the kingdom. That will bring Scotland more in line with the European model, and most certainly the Anglo-Saxon style, as Malcolm's relationship with William Rufus develops, and his experience in the Anglo-Saxon court of Edward the Confessor helps him change Scotland for the better, along with an assistance of a certain Margaret of Wessex. So let's do that. Today, I want us to follow Malcolm through his middle years of kingship as his court reforms take place, the Anglo-Saxon reforms, and his relationship with the English crown develops into a troubling rivalry of such. Let us begin then, just as Malcolm finishes his wedding, to Margaret, his new queen and wife. Now, most people think that in the aftermath of 1066, having won the Battle of Hastings, that William the Conqueror was able to sit back on his newly acquired throne and twiddle his fingers. After all, the story is the conquest of England, and that is usually where the topic stops if you are a school child. However, William spent the rest of his life dealing with the rebellions both in England and in Normandy. His neighbours in Normandy also assumed that if William was in England, that the Norman border would make an easy target. As we touched upon last time when we told Margaret's story, a result of the various rebellions in England, many of the Saxon nobility sought shelter at the Scottish court of Malcolm III. Our king, as we know, ended up marrying Edgar the Ethelin's sister, Margaret, in 1071. Edgar, with his family, arrived in Scotland in 1068, having previously submitted to William, only to join with Gospatric of Northumbria to rebel against William. Last time we spoke of Edgar's family was on board a vessel destined for the continent. Remember, they were originally from Hungary before being invited by Edward the Confessor to return to England when it got beach-wrecked in Scotland. But as far as the narrative goes, Malcolm was concerned his marriage to Margaret gave him a claim to the English throne. Stories tend to linger more on the romance of the fleeing princess rather than the potential for a land grab. It was an opportunity for Malcolm to expand his borders southwards during the times when William had his hands full elsewhere and marry someone of noble birth who are this time was also renowned for her beauty so there is a double bonus there and the person he also married in the first place being the ex-wife of Florin Sigurdsson you know I think he would have preferred the latter considering Florin Sigurdsson had helped overthrow his father with Macbeth in the first place. He celebrated his marriage by invading various bits of Northumberland and South Cumberland. It is probable that he was looking to establish a secure border and annex South Cumberland, which the Normans had not yet got round to quelling aside from the easily accessible coastal areas. In 1072, William, having dealt with the revolting northerners, turned his attention to the Scots. He sent an army across the border as well as a fleet of ships. The Scots and the Normans met at Aberneth in Perthshire. Malcolm, due to the lack of a professional soldiers, lost the ensuing battle, and he was forced to sign the, tru- the Treaty of Abernethy, 
We will touch upon Scottish military might in a later episode, where we can go over the military and its tactics in this age before, in and around Malcolm III's reign. But in short, the military of Scotland was still that of a raised tribal militia, with a small armoured professional contingent that the king himself had. But we'll save all the details for that for a future episode, which I think I've planned to do in three or four episodes time. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle recorded that Malcolm agreed to become William's man, and his sunken Duncan was handed over as a surety for future good behaviour. Now Duncan, as we spoke about last time, was the son of Malcolm III with his first wife, the ex-wife of Florence Sigurdsson, the person who helped kill Malcolm's father Duncan I and take the throne for Macbeth. So with Malcolm and his new marriage to Margaret, his earlier sons to Florence, ex-wife, were kind of forgotten about, and this explains why he was so easily able to give up his son. As to be honest, he probably wanted him out of the way, so his own son with Margaret, Edward, could come to the throne uncontested instead. The son, Duncan's life, however, would be full of great adventure. He would be brought up in the Norman court in England and become a knight, fighting with Robert Curtos in many great battles. Although clearly forgotten about by his dad, he would never forget his homeland, and he would plan to take his right to kingship back. But we'll leave this life and the telling of this tale for the future, where he comes back into our story properly. So, don't fear, Duncan will return, but for now, adios and enjoy the Norman court. This is what the Chronicle had to say. This year, King William led an army and a fleet against Scotland, and he stationed the ships along the coast and crossed the Tweed with his army. But he found nothing to reward his pains, and King Malcolm came and treated with King William, and delivered his hostages and became his liegeman, and King William returned home with his forces. Edgar was asked politely to leave Scotland, and William gave Malcolm lands in Cumberland, which in reality did not receive the Norman stamp until the reign of William Rufus, and even then in times of trouble the Scots were quick to shift the border south. Just as a side, the Norman habit of giving Scottish nobility land in the north of Scotland as a way of turning them into liege men did ultimately change the Scottish language and the politics of the region. This all sounds very clear-cut, but the Normans did not successfully invade Scotland. Scotland remained firmly in the hands of the Scots. I bet a Scottish court, which many felt was becoming angolised by the presence of Margaret, her children by Malcolm, and the assorted ragtag of Saxons who had sought shelter across the border. I feel a slight discretion in the tale coming along. Since we hear so much about him and Malcolm has waged war for his benefit, we should probably go into an in-depth look at Edgar, the brother of our fair Queen Margaret, someone who had a very strong claim to the English throne, as we said. Now, Edgar is Edward the Exile's son, born in 1050 or 1051. On his father's death in February 1057, probably by poisoning, he and his great-uncle, King Edward the Confessor, became the last remaining male descendants of the Sidric, essentially the founder of the Royal House of Wessex, line, hence the Etheling title meaning of noble or royal blood. As such, Edgar was an appropriate candidate for the English crown. King Edward took the Edward exile's family into the English court and cared for them along with Margaret. Had Edward lived a little longer, while Edgar might have been the natural heir to the crown, just as his father had been viewed in a similar way. On King Edward's death in January 1066, Edgar was a contender for the throne. Initially, he was supported by the earls Edwin of Mercia and Morcar of Northumbria at the Witten Council, which met to select the king. However, across the Channel, Duke William of Normandy was making his own claim to the crown based on his relationship with Edward, promises made and a certain well-known oath made by Harold. In reality, a youth without experience, either leading men nor of war, was not an ideal choice for a country about to be invaded. In the aftermath of the Battle of Hastings, the Witten selected Edgar to replace King Harold, who famously died during the battle. Technically, Edgar, rather than King Harold, was the last pre-conquest King of England, but he was never crowned, and besides which spent most of the nominal two months he was king on the run from Duke William. Eventually, he submitted to William in Berkhamsted in December 1066. Edgar lived in William's court, where he was well treated, but was, understandably, kept by William as a hostage to his new subjects for good behaviour. He went to Normandy with the Duke in 1067, 
but when he returned in 1068, he became involved with the Earls Edwin and Morcar once more and soon found himself up to his neck in insurrection. He fled to Scotland very soon afterwards. Unlike the folk of York who had to live with the consequences of William's irritation with the Harren of the North. However, Edgar did have a secret weapon that kept him firmly on the political map, his sister, Margaret, who'd won the heart of King Malcolm III of Scotland when the Ethelings family fled to Scotland in 1067. Malcolm agreed to support Edgar in his bid for the English throne. They didn't have to long wait. In 1069, the people of the north rose against William once more. History repeated itself. Edgar fled once more into Scotland. This process was repeated once more, by which time everyone must have been heartily fed up. There wasn't much left in some parts of the north either. The Doomsday Book shows a marked drop in the value of rents from the pre-conquest to the post-conquest revenues in many parts of Yorkshire. Though, as with everything, there are two sides to every story. One of William's sidekicks, a chap called Alan the Red, who had acquired rather a lot of real estate, probably ensured his own lands weren't terribly badly harrowed. Notwithstanding this, this salient point, it is always worth mentioning that William the Conqueror was allegedly troubled on his deathbed by his unfriendly actions in the north. It's a good story anyway, though not necessarily fair to William. Eventually, King Malcolm III signed this treaty that we mentioned earlier, and that was the end of Edgar's Scottish sojourn. The Ethelene was forced to seek protection from King Philip I in France. Edgar was not a lucky lad. En route to his new host, he was shipwrecked and had to flee back to Scotland. Malcolm sat his brother-in-law down and had a long chat with him, then waved Edgar over the border into England into William's hands. The Conqueror treated the troublesome Ethelene well. He received a pension of £1 a day from 1074 onwards. Clearly, the relationship between Duke William and Edgar must have eased further over time because Edgar went to South Wales campaigning on William's behalf. He was present at William Rufus's coronation, for example, and went on diplomatic missions for William II and became embroiled in the unseemly squabble over the English crown that raged between William and his elder brother, Robert. In the end, Edgar sided with Robert once too often, and after having spent most of his adult life steering difficult political waters to remain on good terms with everyone, William Rufus is the king who had the unfortunate accident with an arrow in the New Forest. The English crown should have gone to his brother Robert, known as Curtos, but hey, little brother Henry was right there while Robert was abroad. Having got his hands on the crown and the royal treasury, he did what anyone would do in these circumstances, and became King Henry I, a similar King Henry I that would marry Edith. Edgar, who had been on crusade with Robert, which we'll be going over the first crusade in its own two-part episode, one about the People's Crusade and the other about Scotland's involvement in the First Crusade, a complete telling of this adventure of bloodshed and sword. But getting back to it, Edgar was also at the Battle of Tinnisbrae in 1106. It didn't do Robert much good. He was captured and imprisoned for the rest of his life. One of the great crusader leaders imprisoned to die a terrible death of boredom, that is. On the other hand, Edgar was welcomed back to the court by Henry I, who had handily married Edgar's Scottish niece Edith, daughter of Malcolm and Margaret, if you remember from last week. Edith, who clearly wanted to win friends and influence people, dropped the Saxon Edith and became the Norman Matilda. Edgar died in 1125, having spent his latter years away from court. He was probably due a few quiet years. But his tale doesn't end there, and he will be a main player with the sons of Malcolm III when, unfortunately, Malcolm III passes away and his sons need to come to the throne and a certain evil uncle tries to take the throne from them. Edgar will be a big player in this. Returning back to 1087 AD, when William Rufus became King of England after his father's death, Malcolm did not want to intervene in the rebellions by supporters of Robert Curtos, which followed. In 1091, William Rufus confiscated Edgar Etheling's lands in England, and Edgar fled north to Scotland. In May, Malcolm marched south, not to raid and take slaves and plunder, but to besiege Newcastle, built by Robert Curtos in 1080. This appears to have been an attempt to advance the frontier south from the River Tweed to the River Tees. 
The threat was enough to bring the English king back from Normandy, where he had been fighting Robert Curtos. In September, learning of William Rufus's approaching army, Malcolm withdrew north, and the English followed. Unlike in 1072, Malcolm was prepared to fight this time, but a peace was arranged by Edgar Etheling and Robert Curtos, whereby Malcolm again acknowledged the overlordship of the English king. In 1092 AD, the peace began to break down. Based on the idea that the Scots controlled much of modern Cumbria, it had been supposed that William Rufus's new castle at Carlisle and his settlement of English peasants in the surrounds was the cause. It is unlikely that Malcolm controlled Cumbria, and the dispute instead concerned the estates granted to Malcolm by William Rufus's father in 1072 for his maintenance when visiting England. Malcolm sent messages to discuss the question, and William Rufus agreed to a meeting. Malcolm travelled south to Gloucestershire, stopping at Wilton Abbey to visit his daughter Edith, or otherwise known as Matilda, and sister-in-law Christina. Malcolm arrived there on the 24th of August 1093 to find that William Rufus refused to negotiate, insisting the dispute to be judged by the English barons. Malcolm refused to accept this and returned immediately to Scotland. When it was looked back upon by chroniclers, it was agreed that Malcolm would meet the English king at Gloucestershire at the end of August 1093, but as reports and journals refer to, on his journey south he took part in a ceremony of laying the foundation stones for the new, that is the present, cathedral at Durham. When the Scottish king eventually reached the English court, William Rufus disdainfully refused to see him, and enraged Malcolm, having visited his elder daughter Edith at Wilton, returned to his land at once and mustered a force which to inflict maximum damage upon English territory. For this reason, therefore, they parted with great dissatisfaction, and King Malcolm returned to Scotland. It does not appear that William Rufus intended to provoke a war, but as the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle reports, war came. Malcolm was accompanied by Edward, his eldest son by Margaret, and probably the heir to the throne, and also by Edgar into this war. As they called their banners and began to move this great Scottish host of an army south, even by the standards of the time, the initial ravaging they visited upon Northumbria by Malcolm and the Scots was seen as harsh, but this would be all a ruse and something that Malcolm would come to regret in hindsight. If we take a step back now, I want to go over the court structure that was introduced in Scotland by Malcolm and his wife, Queen Margaret, with the hints of the Anglo-Saxon reform. For most of the medieval era, the king was an interrent and had no capital as such. The Pictish centre of Fortevote was the chief royal seat of the early Gaelic Kingdom of Alba that became the Kingdom of Scotland. It was used by Kenneth MacAlpin, if you remember, and his brother Donald I MacAlpin. Later poetic tradition suggests that Malcolm III was also a resident, and charters of Malcolm IV were there and William I indicate that it remained important into the 12th century. After this, it fell from the royal circuit, but it remained a royal estate until the 14th century. Malcolm III did decide to start residing in the Great Castle on the Rock in Edinburgh, however. This Great Castle in Edinburgh is one of the finest places to visit if you ever head to Scotland, so please do go visit Edinburgh Castle. Taking court often there as he prepared to go to war in Edinburgh Castle, moving most of the government there and his family, which included Margaret, his sons, and conveniently for the future of our tale, his brother Donald, who was part of Malcolm's court, was not present at Edinburgh Castle. Now, Malcolm had recently declared the heir to the kingdom would be his first son, Edward, similar to the old laws of Alpin that were brought in all that time ago, if you remember, that allowed Duncan I to come to the throne. But the question and rumour at the court of this time, however, was, where is Donald? Where is his brother? Where, he, where has his brother gone? Where could he be and what could he be planning? That question would have to wait for now as Malcolm was ready in his army for war. David I, Malcolm's final living son, tried to build up Roxburgh as a royal centre, but in the 12th and 13th centuries more charters were issued at Scon than any other location, suggesting that that was a centre for royal business, which would make sense considering a lot of people were crowned there. Other popular locations in the early part of the era were by Perth, Stirling and Dunfelm. Little is known about the structure of the Scottish Royal Court in the period before the reign of David I. 
Some minor posts from Malcolm III time and the changes in the offices of state that he introduced with Margaret that are mentioned in later sources are the senior clerks of the provend and the liverance in charge of the distribution of food and the hostratus or later the usher or Dorward who was in charge of the royal bodyguard. With most of the structure changed by Malcolm, further changes would be installed by his sons. And by the late 13th century, the court had taken on a distinctly feudal character. The major officers were the steward or steward, chamberlain, constable, marshal and lord chancellor. Again, all this can trace its heritage back to the Gaelic Pictish times, but the man driving the force behind the kickstart of these new officers were Margaret and Malcolm. Not only had she been changing the Scottish church to be in more line with the European model, but now she was influencing her husband, Malcolm, to create these new offices of state to help him manage his kingdom, just as she had seen Edward the Confessor and potentially the King of Hungary do all those years back when she received her formal education there. Other changes that began to take shape but wouldn't fully evolve till David I's reign was a council of advisers that would help run Scotland with the king. Now, Malcolm's council was small and only really consisted of his sons, his brother-in-law Edgar, and key lords within the Scottish realm, such as those from Moray, Macbeth's homeland. But as it would go on to later be in David I's reign after the crown, the most important government institution in Malcolm's government, was this the king's council composed of the king's closest advisers and presided over by the Lord Chancellor, which had a different name in those earlier days. Unlike his counterpart in England, the council in Scotland retained a legislative and judicial powers, but it was also relatively small, with normally less than 10 members in a meeting, some of whom were nominated by Parliament, particularly during the many future minorities we will have in this era, as a means of limiting the power of a regent. The council was a virtually full-time institution by the late 15th century, and serving records from the period indicate that it was critical in working of royal justice. Normally, members of the council were some of the great magnates of the realm, but they rarely attended meetings. Most of the active members of the council for most of the late medieval period were care career administrators and lawyers, almost exclusively universally educated clergy. The most successful of these would go on to occupy the realm as bishops and towards the end of the period as archbishops. By the end of the 15th century, this group was being joined by increasing numbers of illiterate laymen, often secular lawyers of which the most successful gained preference in the judicial system and grants of lands and lordship. A few tongue twisters there to help us move through this podcast if I do say so myself. But anyway, if we go back to the story, Scotland's relations with England will always be tested as the countries move throughout their history. Something that will be amplified when Edward I gets himself involved with the succession of our great throne. But that is for the future, of course. At this time, Malcolm's daughter would go on to be later known as the Queen of England. So for now, the future isn't so bleak. So, let's leave our king there this week. Malcolm, who is currently in the north of England, in Northumbria, with his son and heir Edward. His sons, by the way, which we'll make time to go over again in next week's episode, don't worry. Edgar, Margaret's brother, and his great Scottish host of Scottish lords and soldiers. He may have noticed how easy it has been to ravage the north of Scotland so easily, and a question that ponders Malcolm's mind is, where is the Lord of Bamborough with his army to defend this land? Why is it so easy for us to conquer so far south so fast? And why wasn't he offering battle and defending his land? In fact, the more he and his son scorched the lands, the more they noticed the lack of defence and the general population that was there. The land around them seemed empty and eerie. One would argue that this was more and should be enough to turn back and regroup, maybe scout the area some more, but Malcolm was made of sterner stuff. He decided to press on, heading further south. As his queen, Margaret, ate her tea in the castle in Edinburgh, she felt a great sense of dread and fear hit her, something that prevented her from sleeping. She felt a great storm was coming, and it was about to hit Scotland. And we're not talking about the weather here. Could this be a warning of things to come, maybe, for our dear king? Well, let's wait till next time to find out. I say next time, and not next week, as next week I want us to take a slight diversion in our tale. We have obviously heard a lot about England and the Normans, since while well, their history is intertwined with Scotland's. 
But due to the Norman influence taking place in our court soon, I thought it'd be good to go over the history of the Normans as a people. A people, yes, that will impact Scotland and already has done. So next week, that's the plan. And then the week after, we will be doing the death of the king and where we'll close the book on Malcolm III. A king who has certainly become my second favourite after Macbeth. Anyway, thank you again to everyone for the continued support on this series. Sorry for any errors throughout the episode. There was a few tongue twisters, uh, but done my best. And I think it was a really good episode to so really happy with how it turned out. And um, if I'm honest, I'm really enjoying this tale that we're getting into. We're going into so much depth recently that we couldn't really do with the Pictish Kings. So now we are spending more than one episode on a king and telling a great story. So I really hope you're enjoying this too. But please do follow our Twitter, as I mentioned, The History of Scotland, or head to our Facebook group, The History of Scotland as well, if you wish to discuss the episodes with myself with feedback and comments. As always, any other corrections or issues with the podcast, you can always let me know at the History of Scotland podcast at gmail.com. That is History of Scotland podcast at gmail.com. G- gonna say, there's been quite a few emails that have been sent through, and I really do appreciate the really kind words and feedback that you've sent through and the questions that you've been asking. And I really hope my answers have helped, well, answer the question that you've asked in the first place. But- first place but honestly really appreciate the kind of words everyone are leaving in emails and also the reviews that are being left on spotify i think we're up to 28 reviews on spotify with a 4.8 rating which is amazing and i'm really glad everyone is enjoying the story of scotland's history but anyway as always please leave a review if you can and our podcast is available on apple podcasts spotify podbean amazon music google podcasts and many other great podcasting sites next podcast will be next week as always as always we'll be doing about three episodes a month but until then stay safe have a great week and i'll catch you all on the next one peace guys